Good morning, Winners Church. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Everybody's feeling good? Yes. Amen. Amen. I'm so excited to be sharing this message with you guys today. Hallelujah. You know, um, first I want to say thank you to Pastor Maurice for allowing me to preach, um, for believing in me, for pushing me. <laughs> and thank you to the rest of the pastoral staff as well. You guys are always encouraging I'm um, always loving towards me and pushing me as well. So thank you guys. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to preach today. Hallelujah. Um, I remember when Pastor told me that I was going to preach, and uh, <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, what am I going to preach? You know. And one day I just stood in my kitchen, and I didn't say it with my mouth. I said it with my heart, and I said to God with my heart, <laughs> I said, Lord, well, what am I going to preach? And the Lord said, I want you to preach about my love. I want you to preach about the father's heart for his daughters, for his sons, for his people. And I was like, all right, Lord, I feel like I'm always preaching about your love. (laughs) Um, But the Lord said, I want my people to get back to knowing my love. I want my people to understand the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, of how much he loves you and how much he adores you and how much he sees you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel like we live in a time where we talk so much about warfare, where we talk so much about deliverance. And even though these are good things, right? But sometimes it's not about laying of the hands on somebody. It's not about um, praying over somebody for five hours. Sometimes people just need a hug. Sometimes people just need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people just need to feel love. Hallelujah. It's not always about praying for somebody for five hours or watching them throw up. (laughs) Pastor Michelle loves that one. (laughs) Sometimes it's really just about sharing the simple gospel. I remember when I was preparing this message and I was thinking about all the ways that I could talk about God's love and all the stories in the Bible that I could use to share God's love. And there was a peace that came over me. And the Lord says, Samantha, just talk about my love. The simple gospel of love. He said that is the most transformational thing that anyone could ever hear is how much God truly loves them. Hallelujah. And so I remember as a young girl growing up, there was a particular family member of mine. I always got stories to share with (laughs) y'all. There was a particular family member of mine who used to tell me over and over again that my mother did not love me, that my mother did not care about me, and that my mother only loved my brothers, and that my mother loved my brothers more than she actually loved me. And I remember this was something that was embedded into my head over and over and over again to the point where I really truly began to think that my mother did not care about me, that my mother did not love me, that my mother did not see me. And it was something that was planted into my head and it made way into my heart. And because it made way into my heart, my attitude changed towards my mother. I remember at at one point I had a journal that I used to write in and I used to write all these things about my mom and how much I disliked her and how much she disliked me and how much I was unseen. Oh my God, I think I'm gonna cry. (laughs) I will not cry. And I used to write in this journal constantly about how much she did not love me and how much she did not see me and how much I hated her. I'm going to be honest. I used to write that I I hate her so much Wow. because of the seed that was planted in my head. And it made me realize that we have to be very careful about the way that we make people feel, about the things that we say to people, about the things that we are hearing over and over again about the things that we listen to every single day when we get up in the morning. It made me realize that, imagine waking up every single day and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine waking up every single day and hearing that God loves you, 
that God is compassionate about you, that God sees you, that God is infatuated with you. Imagine hearing every single day that you are accepted by God. Imagine hearing every single day angels singing to you. Imagine hearing every single day the simple gospel that God loves you. Hallelujah. Imagine that. If a seed, if, if a word that was planted into my head over and over again could affect me in my life and the way that I viewed my mother, imagine if you heard the gospel of love every single day, if you reminded yourself every single day that the Lord loves you, what that would do for your life. Hallelujah, because when we feel love, we feel encouraged. When we feel loved, healing begins to happen. When we feel loved, we feel seen. When we feel love, we feel peace. When we feel love, we feel protected. Hallelujah. And when you feel protected, you walk with your head up high. When you feel protected, you stand up tall. When you feel protected, you have no fear. Imagine if you woke up every single day and reminded yourself that God loves you. Hallelujah. That's why we need to talk more about the Father's love. That's why we need to talk more about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because a lot of people don't understand that God loves them. And as I'm, I'm sharing this message, I'm just remembering, I don't even have this in my message, but I remember I worked at, um, when I was working at Mac Cosmetics, and I was working, and I used to work with a lot of transgender people and a lot of um, homosexuals, gay and bisexuals, and I remember there was one guy um, he's a man, but he was a transsexual, so he dressed like a woman, and he called himself London. And I remember one day, I began to minister to him about the love of the Father. I didn't tell him about his sins. I didn't talk to him about why he's a transgender. I didn't, talk, I didn't point out all the bad things about him, no. I talked to him about the love of God. I talked to him about how much God sees him, about how much God loves him, about how much God adores him. And I remember the very thing that he said to me. He said, I never knew that God loved me. Wow. He said, no one has ever told me that God loved me. People just told me that I'm living in sin. People just told me how much God hates what I'm doing. But no, no one never told me that God loves me. Wow. And that truly hurt my heart. I remember seeing him cry. And I remember leading him to Christ. I remember praying wow. with him and reminding him that God loves him. Hallelujah. 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 See, as I began to mature and as I began to heal over the things that were, were taught to me as a child, over those sayings and those things that were, that were embedded into my head, as I began to heal, I started to realize that, no, my mother did love me. Amen. It was just the simple fact that she didn't know how to show her love. See, growing up in a Haitian household, there wasn't really any hugs, any kisses, and that's not for every Haitian household. But in my household, <laughs> there was no loves, there, there was no hugs, there was no kisses, there was no I love yous. But what happened is that, as I began to heal, I realized that the way that my mother showed her love and affection was by making sure that we went to good schools, was by making sure that we dressed well, that we smelled well, <laughs> that we smelled good, that there was food on the table. She made sure that the home was clean, that she provided for us. That was her way of showing love. And as a matter of fact, my dad, he was not affectionate either. When I tell you I grew up in a household with no affection. <laughs> and I remember the first time that my dad told me that he loved me. I remember that was on my wedding day. And my dad, he was like, Samita, I love you. <laughs> my dad has a very strong Haitian accent. And I remember cringing. I cringed because that was the first time I ever heard that from my dad. That was the first time I ever heard those words. And so it was so weird. It was the weirdest thing ever. And I was just like, uh, okay, I love you too. <laughs> Uh, but we need to hear, I love you, consistently. We should be telling our friends, our family, our children that we love them so that Satan can't make way into their heads. 
Hallelujah. Awesome. Because Satan is waiting to use someone to speak negative things into their head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? The word of God. Yes. We have to constantly make sure that we are hearing the word of God. Come on. We have to constantly make sure that we are feasting on the word of God. We have to constantly make sure that we are reminding ourselves that God truly loves us. You know, when people grow up in a household, sometimes where there's no love and there's no affection, sometimes they make poor decisions, man. They make very poor decisions, whether that's in relationships, whether that's in friendships, and sometimes even career paths. Wow. When I thought about this, I thought about the story of Rahab. And I know that Rahab is preached in so many different ways, but for some reason, the Lord always draws my heart to specific people in the Bible. And I thought about the fact that when I, when I began to read the story of Rahab in Joshua, I said, it was a question that came to my head. And I was like, well, why was Rahab a prostitute in the first place? Mm, that's good. And I said, because most of the times when someone's a prostitute, when she was a harlot, she had all these labels to her. Most of the time when, when people become prostitutes or, or they become, a, you know, well, this kid's in here, um, is either because of abuse, mm -hmm. is either because of lack of love, and, it's, and most of the times it's out of desperation. And so I thought to myself, well, God, what happened in Rahab's life to why she was a prostitute, Father? But one of the things I love about God is that God would use a prostitute. God would use people in the Bible that others may not think should be used. God would use whoever he wants for his purpose and his plan. And that's one of the things I love about God is that you can see the father's heart in every story in the Bible. You can see how the father loves you no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, no matter what people have said about you, no matter what labels are on you, God still loves you and God can still use Amen. you to make history Praise hallelujah God. hallelujah <laughs> hallelujah no matter your history God loves you no matter what your history is God can turn it around in the name of Jesus and he could create a new future for you Amen. hallelujah and he did the same thing with Rahab I love the story of Rahab because in the story of Rahab Rahab gets a new life new love and a new Lord mm. Hallelujah. And so in the story of Rahab, I'm going to tell the story in my way, by the way, guys. <laughs> oh, man, Moses basically dies and God, he now commissions Joshua to bring the children of Israel into the promised land. So now they get to this place called Jericho, right? And Joshua, he sends two spies to go check out the land because they're they about to take over. They're about to just destroy this place. And the two spies go to in, in the land and they end up at Rahab's home. The Bible says that they lodged there. So that means they were there for just a temporary time. And I'm not going to lie to y'all. I was side eyeing the Bible. I said, well, why was they at Rahab's house? <laughs> I was like, why couldn't y'all go to somebody else's house? Why'd you have to end up at Rahab's house? So I was side eyeing the Bible a little bit. Side eyeing the spies like, hmm. Anyway. <laughs> But God's purpose and his plan, it has to get done anyway, anyhow. And I believe that God chose Rahab, and that's why they ended up at Rahab's house. And so here they are. They end up at Rahab's home. And the king of Jericho actually finds out that these spies are at her home. I was like, geez, like they didn't even have cell phones back then. Like, how did that, like, how did you even find out? Man. So, you know, the king of Jericho, he gets upset and he makes his way to Rahab's home. He basically tells Rahab, yo, bring these spies out. And y'all already know what he probably was going to do. He probably was going to kill them. <laughs> and so now Rahab, she thinks quickly on her feet and she hides these spies. And she basically tells the king of Jericho that the spies, they, yes, they were here. I don't know where they came from, but they're gone. <laughs> They ain't here no more, so go, hurry up and go look for them. <laughs> but mind you, they was in, they was in the, they was at, um, in the roof. And so 
the king of Jericho, he goes out with his guys. They go looking for these men. And then what happens here is that Rahab, she goes and have a conversation with these spies. And she basically tells these spies, it's like, look, I know that the Lord has given you this land. And I want you guys to turn with me to your Bibles. Because I want you guys to read this with me so that you guys can see for yourselves what I'm about to point out. Turn with me to Joshua 2.11. Let me grab some water while y'all do that. <laughs> Let me know if you're there, say I'm there. Is this good, guys? And it says, as, and as soon as we heard these things, this is Rahab talking, our hearts melted. I want you to pay attention to that. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you also will show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token and spare my father, spare my mother, my brothers, my sister, and all that they have, and deliver us from death. I want to point out something where it says, and our hearts melted. And I asked God, basically, I said, God, what does it mean that their hearts melted? And the Lord said, I had to capture Rahab's heart. If you guys are taking notes, my first point is the captured heart. God had to capture Rahab's heart by all means. And even if he had to capture it and Rahab had to fear the Lord. God had to capture Rahab's heart because in order for God to use Rahab, he had to have her heart. Hallelujah. He captured her heart for his plan and his purpose. He captured her heart so that he could rescue his people, but he also captured her heart so that he could rescue her. Now that's love. God rescued Rahab's heart to show her his love and affection for what's about to happen. He captured her heart and he gave her courage. He gave her compassion. He gave her strength and he gave her love. In order to have compassion and kindness that she showed to the spies, she had to have the heart of the father. There was no way that God could use Rahab if she did not have the heart of the father. There was no way that he could use Rahab if she did not have kindness, if she did not have compassion, if she did not have the love of God. And it's the same way that God captures our hearts first. He captured my heart first. He transformed my heart first. He took all the broken pieces and put it back together first before he could actually use me before I could stand up here and share a message the Lord had to heal my entire heart first and he can do the same for you hallelujah hallelujah Hallelujah. God is the God that captures our hearts God is the God that loves you tremendously God is the God that sees you that can transform your entire life God can use you the same way that he uses Rahab hallelujah hallelujah God is the God that he he captures. He captures our hearts and he melts it for his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your holy name, Father. And so now the spies are basically about to leave Rahab's house, but Rahab and the spies, they go on conversating and they basically tell Rahab, like, look, Because, you know, Rahab is basically saying, yo, show me the same kindness that I showed y'all. Please listen, man. But the the spies, they're like, listen, as long as you're not a snitch, (laughs) as long as you do not snitch on us and you don't go back to the king of Jericho, you don't go back to anybody and tell anybody our plans and what's about to happen. We will save you. We will not kill you. And so as the spies they leave her home, they go down, they go out through this window and there's a cord 
a rope basically that they use, that Rahab used to let them out. And the spies basically tell Rahab, like, listen, man, this is how you're going to be saved. You see this cord that you let us down from? I need you to tie this red, this blood red cord on your window so that when we come to destroy the land, we will bypass you. If this cord is not on your window, then your blood is not on our hands or your families. And, you, and, and as a matter of fact, all of her family had to be all in one household. And so Rahab puts the cord on her window. The, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a red cord. It's like a scarlet red cord. And the spies go back to Joshua, and they basically tell Joshua, like, truly the Lord has delivered this land into our hands. And so now the day of destruction comes, and this land, Jericho, is burned with fire. Everything is destroyed. But the only thing that is not destroyed is Rahab and her household. Rahab and her household were saved. Rahab and her household were rescued. Rahab and her household were not touched. Why? Because of the significance of this cord, this red scarlet cord hanging from her window. So they knew to bypass her home. And this red cord, this red rope, it is significant to Christ's redemption on the cross. Because of what of Christ did, what Jesus did for us on the cross, we bypass death. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we are saved. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, death bypasses us. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for us, we don't have to suffer the consequences of sin. Because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, Satan bypasses us in your household in the name of Jesus. Sickness bypasses you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Christ shed his blood on the cross just for us, just for me, just for you. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Father God. Rahab was saved because of her courage. Rahab was saved. Her family was saved because of her courage. Hallelujah, Lord. When God captures our hearts, he uses us for his glory. When God captures our hearts, he teaches us how to forgive. When God captures our hearts, he puts in us a new heart. He, he removes everything that is not like him. He captured Rahab's heart and he used Rahab to make history in the Bible. Hallelujah. You know, my second point, when God captures our hearts, God changes ours. The father's, the, my second point is the Father's heart changes our hearts. The same way that God changed Rahab's heart is the same way that he has changed my heart and is the same way that he can change yours. Amen. So if you're taking notes, you can write down the Father's heart changes our hearts. As humans... I know that there's many of us in this place that have dealt with fear, that has dealt with unforgiveness, that have dealt with shame, that have dealt with um, being lied on or being lied to, uh, with disappointments. I know that I have. But one of the things that God had to teach me was how to forgive. One thing that God had to teach me was how to see people the way that he sees them. One thing that God has to, had to teach me was how to heal from my own trauma, from my own mess so that I can see people the way that God sees them through his heart, through his lens. Because when we look at people, we look at them from our lens. When you have the heart of the Father, you look at people through the Father's lens. You look at them through his heart. You look at them through his perfection, through his love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God had to show me his heart first, and then his heart changed my heart, and then my heart changed for others. I want to share with you a dream that I had. <laughs> Pastor be loving my dreams. <laughs> I want to share with you a dream that I had. 
in this dream, I remember I was sitting in my car and my car could not move. The car was stuck, basically. And I remember there was like a puddle of water around the car to the point where I couldn't drive the car. Excuse me. Um, and then when I looked up, and mind you, all the windows were, were up in the car. I was like, I think it was like hot in there too. It's like, bro, the car wouldn't even turn on. I couldn't even put down the windows. But anyway, <laughs> side note. Um, when I looked up, I remember when I looked up, I saw someone coming towards me to help me. And the person that came towards me to help me in this dream was the very person that I was offended with. Mm. It was the very person that I felt hurt me over and over again. It was the very person who disappointed me so many times. It was the very person who I felt only called when they needed something. It was the very person that uh, I just really could not forgive because I was just over them. <laughs> but I remember when I woke up from this dream, the Lord basically said to me, don't drown in unforgiveness. Let go and be free. Wow. And I thought that was such a powerful dream because what happens is that just like I was in this car and this car couldn't move and there was all this water surrounding the car. It's the same way in life where we are paralyzed sometimes by our unforgiveness. We are paralyzed by the hurt that we've experienced from people. And because we are paralyzed by it and because we are so stuck in offense and unforgiveness, we can't move. We can't grow. God can't use us. Offense paralyzes us. And the Lord loves us so much the Father wants you to have his heart. The Father wants to heal you from all the pain and all the trauma. Amen. Hallelujah. If I didn't walk in forgiveness towards people that hurt me, there was no way that God could use me. If I didn't walk in forgiveness towards people that I felt didn't deserve forgiveness, mm. there's no way that I could stand up here and share a message. Hallelujah. God had to work on my heart. And I believe that God is working in the hearts of his people. I believe that the Lord is working on the hearts of his people and sharing his love so that you too can see people differently, so that you too can see your family differently, so that you too can experience the true love of God. It's a love relationship that God wants to have with us. It's an it's a intimacy that God wants to have with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Forgiving someone, it means that you see them how God sees them. There's a scripture that I want to show with you, share with you guys. In Matthew 22, 37. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And the second is like, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, there's two things that the Lord is telling us in this scripture. If you really sit and dissect it, if you really sit and read the scripture, the first thing that God is giving us is a command for our personal lives. God is saying, you shall love the Lord with all of your heart. It's a command for your heart to be wide open and for God to capture your heart, <laughs> for God to melt your heart to remove everything that is not like him so he can place himself in us. Mm -hmm. God is saying, love me with all of your heart. Why? Because if you can't love God with all of your heart, you can't love people. Wow. If you can't love God with all of your heart, there's no way that you can even love yourself. It took me a long time to love myself. Wow. It took God healing me to be able to love myself. There was no way that I can show love to others if I can't show love to myself. So the first thing that God sh shows us is a command. Love God with all of your heart. And the second is that we must love our neighbors as we love ourselves. You can't do the second without the first. The first is a commandment. The second is an instruction. There's no way that you can love your neighbor if you can't love God with all of your heart. Hallelujah.
You know, and the, you know, Peter in Matthew 18, 21, Peter basically uh, um, came to Jesus and asked Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and, for, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus basically says, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Basically, Jesus is saying that forgiveness is unlimited. The same way that we say that God's supplies to us is unlimited. But forgiveness is unlimited. God requires us to have unlimited forgiveness towards his people. God requires us to have unlimited forgiveness towards even the people that you may dislike, even the people that may disappoint you over and over again. Why? Because Jesus has unlimited forgiveness towards us. And that's how much he loves us. Every time we mess up, he forgives us. Every time we walk away, he forgives us. Every time we, we don't feel worthy enough, he forgives us. And so for that reason, God is saying, don't count how many times you've forgiven somebody. That's right. Forgive freely as I've freely forgiven you. I want you guys to say this with me. Love has a heart of forgiveness. Love has compassion. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love causes us to forgive. Love brings people to God. Love heals the brokenhearted. And love is unconditional. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you remind yourself of that over and over again, walking in love won't be hard. If you remind yourself of the words that God has said in his word, you remind yourself over and over again, walking in love won't be hard. I think I've told these stories many times, but when God began to work on my heart, God began to teach me how to forgive. God began to teach me how to give. God began to first teach me how to forgive those that I did not want to forgive. God began to first teach me how to forgive the people that truly, truly, truly hurt me. Praise God. Even that one particular family member who used to drill that one saying in my head that my mother didn't love me. That caused so much pain towards me. But God taught me how to forgive. God taught me how to love. God God taught me how to love even those tough family members that boy, oh boy, they get on your nerves. (laughs) Hallelujah. God is a God of love. He's a God of forgiveness. He's a God that forgives us over and over again. He's a God that that walks with us, that talks with us, that has direct relationship with us. God wants to have a direct relationship with us so that he can remove everything that is not like him. So that he can put a new heart in us. So he can do a heart surgery in us. Or give us a new heart, like a heart transplant. (laughs) Removing the old and giving us the new. Thank you, Jesus. Renewing our mindsets. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Father God. And because of love, one, th- one thing that I notice with children is that when children, they feel loved and compassion from their parents, they f- there's a protection that they feel. There's yeah. a confidence that they have. There's a boldness that they have. Mm-hmm. And that's how we should be with the Father. Knowing that nothing can come against us, nothing can touch us, Amen. that we are always protected. Amen. Have you ever seen a, a child crossing the street with their father? And right before, when you get to the edge where the street is, what do they do? They put out their hands yeah. and they cross. Why? Because they know that that parent is going to protect them. They know that that parent is not going to let them get hit by a car. And that's how we should be walking with God, Amen. hand in hand, God. feeling confident, yeah. feeling loved, feeling protected. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're taking notes, write down this third point. Love overpowers fear and it overpowers darkness and evil.
I remember as a kid in the same household <laughs> where they told me my mother didn't love me. <laughs> oh, man. Um, one of my cousins, she used to chase me with this doll. <laughs> My uncle had bought us this, these dolls from Haiti, and I hated them so bad. I just, God forgive me, but I hated this doll, like, with a passion. I didn't like the way the doll looked. I just, it was just so ugly. God forgive me. And my cousin knew it. And she would take this doll and turn off all the lights. <laughs> and she would chase me around the house with this doll because she knew that I was scared of the dark, and she knew that I was a little scared of the dark. <laughs> and she would chase me with it. And she would chase me up the steps, and I mean, I would run so fast. I would run so fast, and it was just something that happened over and over and over again every time I spent the night there. <laughs> but what happened is that the same way that these words were spoken over me, is that even in that moment where the, I feared the darkness so bad, I took that on with me into my adulthood. Wow. I was so scared of the dark that I would pray with my eyes open. I was so scared of the dark that I could not walk into a dark room and be confident. I was so scared of the dark that literally, as soon as I walk in my apartment, man, all the lights is on. All the lights are on. But you know, what happened was, when I began to truly have a relationship with God, when God truly began to transform my heart, when God truly began to teach me that there is no fear in love, when God began to truly show himself to me, when I began to truly have a friendship with God, there was something that happened where it's just like a child who's confident knowing that the Father is right there. Amen. It's just like a child knowing that the Father protects and loves me. When I learned the gospel of love, it literally changed my entire view of the dark. It changed my entire view of darkness. And I remember walking into my room one day, closed the door, and turned off all the lights. Wow. And I began to pray to my Heavenly Father. I didn't close my eyes, because, honey, when I used to close my eyes and, and I used to open them, I used to think something was going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I would be washing my, and this is as an adult, guys, like as an adult. <laughs> I used to wash my face in the shower and quickly open them like, oh my God, like I can't keep it closed for too long because something's <laughs> going to be there. But I would, I went into the room, closed the door, and I began to pray with all the lights off. And it was the most freeing thing I ever did. And why? Because I knew that the Father was right there with me. Amen. Because I knew that fear does not involve torment. Come on. God is not the God of torment. God is not the God of fear. God is not the God of anxiety. God is not the God that would cause you to be scared of the dark. God is not the God that would cause you to be scared of demons and witches and warlocks. No, we have power and authority in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The devil wants you to believe that the father does not love you. The, the devil wants you to believe that the father will not protect you. The devil wants you to believe that God does not care about you, that God does not love you. The devil wants you to believe that he is more powerful, that the darkness is more powerful than your heavenly father. That God loves you so much that he will constantly consistently walk with you hand in hand. His angels surround you. His angels protect you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm no longer scared of the dark. And even sometimes when that fear tries to come on me, no, I don't allow it. 
I don't allow it Come because on. God is so much bigger than Satan and his little, his little self, on, his, little, his little demons. In 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fears. Because I understood the gospel of love, I understood God's heart for me. It cast out all of the fears that I once had. Hallelujah. And it says, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. When I feared the dark, I was not made perfect in love. When I feared the dark, I did not understand how much God loved me, how much God saw me. I didn't understand that I was God's princess. Second Timothy 1, 7 says, fear for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Fear can stand no chance when you stand in God's love. Hallelujah. Fear has no chance in your life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If there's any fears that you have in your life, I encourage you to stand in the love of God. I encourage you to enter into a place of worship. I encourage you to enter into a place where God's love is spilling all out of you in the name of Jesus. I, I, I encourage you to enter into intimacy with God, into friendship with God, because truly that's what God is looking for, because truly that is what God wants. He wants to be in relationship with us. He wants us to forgive. He wants us to love, because once we forgive, we're able to love on others. God wants this world to be a world of love, of compassion in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you in this place today feel that God loves you? Hallelujah. It should be every hand raised.